Welcome back to the Levity Zone with Dr. Bruce. The second Ohi Salon opens with the sharing of a vision of the world of 2050. In this wondrous world of the imagination, the ideal outcome has occurred and we are living in a safe and sane, healthy civilization, nestled nicely on a recovered and restored verdant earth. How did we get there? I ask you to suspend yourself in disbelief for a while and just settle back and enjoy the given vision. Oh, hi, Salon number two. Yeah, <laughs> we made it. We made it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about the introduction all week long, and I thought about so many uh, ways that I could introduce Bruce Damer and the, the old Taoist axiom just kept popping back into my head, which was, uh, for those who don't know, uh, no words are enough. <laughs> and for those who do, none are necessary. <laughs> so I decided to let myself off the hook with that as the introduction. So we're looking towards a vision for the future. 2050. Sort of boldly looking into the steps that exist between here and there uh, and the extraordinary measures one could take to help. As our friend Terence McKenna said so many times, to pull our chestnuts out of the fire. <laughs> <laughs> so that will be the theme of the evening's discussion and the format will be Bruce will speak for a um, half hour to 45 minutes on the topic share some ideas that then we can have a question and answer period after that. So with that, I'll, I'll give it to you first. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, what I'm going to try to do, and this is this is a part of a new speaker series that I'm starting here. This is the will it play in Peoria? You know, does it fly in Ojai, for example? Because in two months I'll be doing it in a very large dome of people at the Burning Man Festival. Oh. Um, and it's it's an outgrowth of a, a talk I gave last year. What started at Burning Man last year was this collective group of us met on how do we reinvent lives so we don't put energy into the current system, take energy out of it, remove ourselves from it, and invent a new system. And it just got started last year. What we're seeing is young people that are coming sort of out of their teens and into their 20s, and they kind of look forward, they look around, and they see the craziness of the world, and they see careers they don't want in organizations they don't believe in and they are seeking alternatives so that's the audience that I'm talking to cooperatives yeah they want cooperatives they want they want something else how do we reinvent lives they are seeking alternatives they are seeking How do we reinvent lives? They are seeking alternatives. They want something else. Invent a new system. Invent a new system. I found that throughout my life, if I had a period where I had this dream of a project in the future, and I, I fully, re I fully had the, the imaginative explosion around that project, like the best possible. What if I started a museum of something, collected all these cool things, and then had people visiting, and what could possibly happen? And I had this full imaginative explosion, exploration explosion. 
it generally set the universe into motion. So this idea, this wish, this dream was put out there and then the universes came back with the stepping stones of how to get there. Wow. Yeah, it's happened my whole life. Working for NASA for 10 years, when I started out, it was like, what if I could be designing a whole space mission? And within seven years I was. Or, you know, garments. I wanted to learn how to make clothes. You know, what if I could learn to make clothes? I could make this cool jacket and I had a drawing of it. Within two years I was making that jacket. Just because you have a clear thing in your imagination, I think it just sets things in motion. So could we do this for our civilization? Could we imagine a best possible outcome? Say way in the future, 37 years in the future, which seems like a long way, but it's not. It's a short time. So perhaps 2050 is not, it's not too far out. But if you say something beyond 2050, people think, oh, I won't even be alive then, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's just too far for people to imagine. So I think of this as the world of 2050 plus something when the ideal outcome has happened. But we don't know how it happened, just that it did. And you're dropped down into that world. What would that world look like? And there's many ideal outcomes. But there's some common threads to an ideal world. And I thought I would kind of go down this fun list of them, if, you, if you'll permit me, of, of ideal outcomes. This idea, this wish, this dream, was a dream. And you're dropped down into that world, what would that world look like? This idea, this wish, this dream, was a and you're dropped down into that world, what would that world look like? This idea, this wish, this dream was a dream. I did a similar exercise for the Occupy movement, my little contribution to Occupy two years ago, which was what if the ideal outcome had happened for the United States, which was a constitutional convention was being convened and they were, everybody was just getting together to reinvent the system. So I described the convention and what was happening on the convention floor. And then I got in touch with Lawrence Lessig, who actually is working on this stuff. Oh, I heard him speak last week. Yeah. So, <laughs> and he said, I'm working on that ideal outcome. We just had a conference on this at Harvard with my Tea Party friends and my, my left-wing friends. And everyone came because they all believed that the Constitutional Convention was a good idea, you know, just in principle. So he, he's a great coalition idea builder. So I thought, well, this, this kind of works. Because I wrote this piece, I was on conservative talk radio, on right-wing talk radio. That's the people who are interested in, with callers about that. So I realized there's a power to envisioning ideal outcomes and putting them in, in front of people. So here goes, if, you're, if you'll permit me, <laughs> give you some ideal outcomes for the world of 2050. We have no idea how any of this will happen, but imagine if it did. There's a power to envisioning ideal outcomes. We have no idea how many of this will happen, but imagine it has dead. So outcome number one, this world of 2050, it's a garden world, and that humanity, for however it has done it, is probably a maximum of one-third and maybe closer to one-fifth of the current population. And I can suggest one way, you know, you do the math, if you have one child per family, within three, four generations, your population is cut down by two thirds. And suddenly there's tremendous resource available. The pressure's off the land, and uh, you can decide which shopping malls to tear down and replace by parks or gardens. You just don't need any of that stuff anymore. But that's the only prescription I'll give for maybe how we got there, because otherwise, you know, such a population change is, is going to be 
you know, catastrophic, if, if a disease happened or a war happened, this ideal world would not result. It has to happen in some peaceful way. So the planet is restoring, the natural world is restoring. Uh, forests are growing. We don't need nearly what we need for agriculture anymore. So that's happening. We have a humane and healthy human world, both in inner space and outer. So inside the soul, the spirit, and also our bodies are healthy somehow. Forests are growing. The planet is restoring. The pressure is off the land. The natural world is restored. The soul is the spirit also our bodies. And then we have this wonderful opportunity in the world of 2050 of, I call it the world of recovered and sustainable resources. What we're doing in 2050 is we're mining landfills. <laughs> so we're, we have these great big machines that are called bucket wheel excavators and we're churning through landfills and every Barbie doll from 1958 oh, every tin can top every every little piece is goes through a cyclonic sorter and guess what we produce enormous reserves of ingots of metal of recovered resins and we can just do this so well that we have vast warehouses of recovered material. We don't ever have to mine. We won't have to mine for 500 years. There will be so much recovered material. So we don't have to operate those industries because we can just get it back from where we left it. We're consuming less too, and we're always recovering and making products that can be reused and they last longer. So we're also cleaning up the earth. world of recovered and sustainable resources. We're mining landfills. Every Barbie doll bar Every tin can top. Produce enormous Produce reserves of ingots of metal. In this world of 2050, we've mastered the art of early childhood nurturing education. So, in this humane, healthy human world, we have inner peace and we have outer peace, and inner health and outer health. And we know how to do early childhood nurturing, teaching, education communal bonding, we know that, We've, we just know how to do it. So children that are coming up through the system are incredibly in better shape. And that this is a world which is the primacy is the heart and not the mind, not the head. Somehow our, our world is guided much by the heart rather than the head. So that's another ideal outcome. Childhood, childhood, nurturing, nurturing, nurturing education. education. We have inner peace in the about inner health and outer health. health. Nurturing, nurturing, teaching, nurturing, education, education, communal bonding. 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 Our world is guided by much by the heart. Another thing in the world of 2050, it's a, a world of incredible wisdom about the power of personality. So that being 
the, the little kid on the school playground that decides that he can have influence over other kids, that's an instant trigger because there's something called sociopathy and psychopathy. It's about 2% of the population. It's a condition of, of the genetic code that produces an individual who they can have great achievement in their life, but they don't have the guilt gene and the empathy gene. They don't have the empathy part of their brain. These people are both a huge resource and asset. They're also extremely dangerous for a primate civilization. So really early on, we identify oh, right. the sociopathic and psycho psychopathic. The bullies. Bullies. Yeah, the bullies. And, and the ones that are doing it not even in a bullying way, the sort of the passive aggressive. And we, we don't stamp them with a, a star that says P and it's for psychopathy. We lovingly and as best we can, we help them develop because they need a whole different development program because they're possibly never going to be in a position of leadership where they control the fates of others because if they don't have an em empathy part of their mind, they can't. It just, just disqualifies them. It's almost like if your vision is poor and you can't be a commercial airline pilot, it's the same sort of thing. You know, you, you, you lack an essential, empathy is an essential quality for leadership. So none of those people are running corporations or them are running for office. They just just can't. Uh, but they can be some of the most, uh, you know, the charismatics, right? They're the charismatics. So they have a role in society, and we really celebrate that role. But you know, it's adult supervision here. Psychopathy and sociopathy have a long history of devastation and civilization, and that can't continue. Power of personality. There's something called sociopathy and psychopathy. Extremely dangerous for a primate civilization. Lovingly and as best we can, we help them develop. Empathy is an essential quality for leadership. Psychopathy and sociopathy have a long history of devastation and civilization, and that can't continue. In 2050, we have a visionary world of inquiry and universal acceptance. So people are supported in, in, in the spiritual inquiry. And whether they are doing it through, you know, Eastern practices, their own invented practices, through spirit medicine practices, through following of teachers, everyone's accepted and celebrated in their inquiries. All inquiries are accepted. So that's part of this world. Visionary world of inquiry and universal acceptance. Eastern practices. Their own invented practices. Spirit medicine practices. Following of teachers. And in this world of 2050, there's no longer a need for religion, an organized religion where it's something dictated and fills the void, because people are healthy. They're on spiritual inquiry, their hearts are open, and they just don't, wouldn't have the need for it. It's like if, if you attain that state in yourself of real health and happiness, you would never sit in most religious services because you'd find them pretty empty. Just a lot of words. Religions just wither and they go away. It is not needed. People are healthy. Their hearts are open. 
if you attain that state in yourself of real health and happiness, religions just wither and they go away. In 2050, it's a world that seeks knowledge of the big questions. So everyone's interested in you know, where did we come from? You know, what's the age of the universe? How did it form? What are the deepest philosophical drivers in the primate mind? What makes us up? How do we boot up as a species? Deep questions, scientific questions, philosophical questions. And that's in the world. That's just part of this world of 2050 now. Where did we Where come did we from? Come from? Where did we come from? We come from. What makes, what us, makes up? us up? Makes us up. What makes us up? Makes us up. What's the age of the universe? How did it form? How did we boot up as a species? How did we boot up as a species? In 2050, we have a sane economic sphere. There's no bubbles. <laughs> There's no one gaming the system. There's no concentration of wealth. People are very careful about where wealth is flowing. It's not a communist system. It's not a capitalist system. It's just a sane, sensible system that's well-oiled and tuned so that, you know, products are made, but people are not in sweatshops. The beautiful agricultural new products are there, but they're not genetically modified and they're not covered with pesticides. And it's just sane. It's just sensible and sane. Waste is reduced tremendously. Kind of like your way your grandmother would have run her kitchen, you know, a sane economic sphere. A sane economic sphere. Just a sane, sensible system. And it's just sane. It's just sensible and sane. Kind of like your way your grandmother would run the kitchen. A sane economic sphere. This world of 2050 would be both a broad and a wide world. The broad world is that everyone has the basics, everyone has health, they have all these things that I've mentioned. The wide world is that no one should be restricted from exploring further. There's not a ceiling place. If somebody in the Peruvian Amazon and they decide, I'm, I'm really drawn to doing something in the Himalayas to do with such and such, then the world provides. So the person can move up. They can move widely and they can move up. They can change their position. They're supported, that's a priority. Exploring, 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 exploring. And the Peruvian Amazon, 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 Amazon. In the Himalayas, Himalayas, Himalayas. Then the world provides, 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 provides. Then the world provides, 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 provides. The world of 2050 is a creative world of artists and appreciation of artists. Like Bali, in Bali, everyone's an artist. That's one of the things that's so appealing about the place. Everyone's sort of born as an artist or a musician. Everyone has a practice. They're, they're helped with and encouraged. It's just in their culture. So that would be part of our world of 2050. The creative world of artists and appreciation of artists. Everyone sort of born as an artist or musician. Everyone has a practice. They're helped with and encouraged. The great tragedy of this time now is that you're driving in your car and you just feel completely cut off from other people. So a major project of the civilization of 2050 is people should feel absolutely surrounded with support and love and nurturing and not separateness. Everyone's making eye contact. 
they're watching out for everyone else and not in a kind of a suspicious kind of a way, of a manipulative way. People truly care about that next person. So if someone seems to, you know, feel poorly, others are going to come and help them. And if, if they don't need that, then others will respect that. But separateness is something that has crept into the human condition since the plains of Africa when we were living in these close-knit balls of our brethren for defense and for togetherness and genetic reasons. But we were very, very close to the rest of our kin. And from that point on, the modern world has created these egg cartons of separate people. People should feel absolutely surrounded with support and love and nurturing. And the sister to the removal of separateness is the coming of a world where we're no longer separate from our co-inhabitants of the planet, which is the animal and plant kingdom, where we're looking in the eyes of another human and feeling love because it's a heart-centered world. When we look in the eyes of an animal, we feel the same thing. You know, they're co-inhabitants and their lives and their future must be respected. So whatever that means, that means we stop eating them or we change the oh, way. Good. Hmm? Good. Yeah. Sounds great. So because our population is so much reduced, their habitats have recovered and we can peaceably live in that world. Neolithic peoples would bless the spirit of the mastodon when they killed it and the mastodon's meat would come back to the village and part of that was a ceremony to bless and thank its spirit for giving its energy for the Neolithic town. And they, they had that kind of respect and fear. <laughs> in a ways they were, they were equals in the world. Their lives and their future must be respected. Their habitats have recovered, and we can peaceably live in that world. Bless the spirit of the master. For giving its energy. For giving its energy. This world of 2050 would be very cognizant of its past, where it came from. We would have museums, you know, online and physical museums, where we would literally say, this is where we came from. Here's the crazy world that we used to be in. And in those glass display cases, sorry? That would be great. Isn't that great? The museum of the nutty world, so that we, we are not going to go back there, and we can actually study it lovingly, and we're glad we're not there anymore. But there would be display cases where there would be... Cavemen. Yeah, the cavemen. There would be a, you know, a religious book. Like, we don't do this anymore. Or some of the other examples, like, here's a, some crazy Fox video. Or here's, here's a, an election pamphlet for when we had these crazy things called elections, which made no sense and were, they were just activities that we think of now as strange, but we, we would appreciate that and we would rewind the tape and go back to the Romans did it this way or the Chinese did it this, so in the tribal world we would try to see how do we actually finally learn all the lessons and we got to the world we're in now so we're very cognizant about that past we don't forget that because otherwise we're doomed to repeat it you know history not known is doomed to be repeated How do we How actually, actually finally learn all the lessons? How do we actually finally learn all the lessons? We're coming close to the end here. All of this would give us 
a chance for respite and for rest. So for example, this would be a world of, I call it, humane speeds. One of the things that Galen tells me is she said, you know, in the 50s and 60s when we were driving on the, the Merritt Parkway and things like that, so the average speed was like 35 to 50 miles an hour. And you could kind of still understand the world was going by. You could see people in other cars. Now if it's 75 or 80, you're totally separate. It's so fast. I, I had the same experience that I went to the Merritt no. Parkway just decades ago. And I, I went back to Way. Yeah. yeah, and so the speeds at which life moves, including cell phone messages and constant stuff, has exceeded our ability to really be okay with it. And we're now in a state of low level anxiety and separateness from too much speed. So now as a civilization, I think we know what the boundary is roughly. The Dalai Lama has a great expression for this. He says, well, about this speed and pace of modern life, the way it affects me is when I'm traveling and speaking and I come back to Dharamsala, uh, what I have to do is I sit in Dharamsala because my soul has missed some flight connection because its speed is slower than, than my body's being forced to do to meet all these obligations. So my soul makes the flight connections, <laughs> gets its baggage, and it, one to two weeks later, as I'm sitting in Dharamsala, it finally gets back to me, comes into me, and then I can be here. But because that's what it does to a sensitive, profound being like him, he says it's just too hard. So he has to wait the two weeks to reconstitute himself. Whereas all of us are in this maelstrom of the quickening or the pace is too fast. So we slow the civilization down we find that comfort zone, which means we modify all of our technology. So instead of driving at, you know, 75 miles an hour on the 101 and zooming up to Ojai here, we, we actually built a funny little, almost Victorian looking rail system. Kind of a little bit like the Ojai trolley, but as a rail system, you can step on anywhere and it takes you into Ojai at 35 miles an hour. You don't have to drive, you don't have to be separate, and it doesn't matter because your life has far fewer demands upon it now. You're not having to like, oh, I gotta drop the kids off here, and then I have to do the shopping, and I have to go to Costco, and I have to solve this problem with the phone company, and no, because everything's been slowed down to allow human beings to, to live in a more humane way. A person could put their hand up and say, yeah, I'm now, I'm too busy. We need to remove this whole thing out of our civilization to not push that button. So we slow the civilization so down. We slow the civilization so down. Slow. It doesn't matter because your life has far fewer demands upon your life has far fewer demands upon your life has far fewer demands upon your life has far fewer demands So we slow the civilization down slow the civilization down slow the civilization down Recently, when I turned 50, I hit a burnout wall where so much had happened in my life, too much, that I finally hit that wall where you can't get up in the morning. Your, your, your mind has just been overcharged and overcharged, and it's sometimes called an adrenal shock syndrome. And people overcome it by drinking lots of stimulants, yeah. And they keep getting stimulated, but the adrenal system is, yeah, it burns them out and it's a physiological change. And so we know that we're through. We, we know that we're too far out. When I worked with NASA for 10 years, the astronauts were floating outside of the shuttle or the space station doing their work. They were getting pinged by ground control on one side of their helmet and seeing visuals of 3D work tasks over here and people are floating up here and there's so much going on. 
It's a constant flow of overload information. So about every hour or two, they're ordered to stand down and just pause. Because they've learned through experience that these people who are highly capable overload and black out. The commanders of the Mir space station, the commander blacked out for about 30 seconds. He went completely uh, black, like semi-unconscious, and then they had a collision with an incoming spacecraft that almost destroyed the station. And it was just because he's just so overloaded. So, like an autistic child gets overloaded quickly, right, because they're super, super sensitive to, to imagery coming in. They're at one end of the scale, and then astronauts get overloaded here, and we're kind of toward the astronaut side of overload. So we slow our civilization down so that we're in a range of staying healthy. So in summary, you have you know, high quality childhood. As a civilization, we invest a huge amount into childhood. That's the number one priority. It isn't a military industrial complex because there isn't a military industrial complex as a gun. It's childhood education. If you go to places like Denmark, run, They're the happiest country in the world. Happiest country in the world, yeah. And, and early childhood development's way at the top. That's why. So you have all that and you have all this working together in this world. And then what that allows you to do is you can have a world with a plan because you now have your own destiny. You have your future back. You can make, as a, as a planet, with all the beings on it, human and non-human, and all the ecosystems, and you've got all that down, sustainable, healthy environments, you can now make a plan, like a 50-year plan, a 100-year plan, a 500-year plan, a 5,000-year plan, for what is this civilization? What, it, what are we? We were brought into the world by immense miracles of chance and evolution and billions of years of almost astounding miracles that if you look at them and you try to grok them, it's greater than any religious story, for example, the reality. So we've grokked that. We know we're incredibly rare. So as a, as a planet or as a civilization, we can take on big, big missions. Some of the missions might be let's try to all live to about 200 or 250 years so we can have more of this wondrous existence. You know, does that make sense? So the whole civilization can, can go lots of places. So we can take on the grand projects. Is it traveling to the stars? Is that too ambitious? Is it extending our lives? Is it really understanding where we came from, what we are as beings? The universe contrived by incredible happenstance to make this thing happen. We owe the universe, to some extent, to go out and fully experience the miracle. So that's, that's kind of the conclusion here, and perhaps we can't understand what that great plan is, but it, it would be the base upon which, if we'd done all this and we were at the world of 2050 plus, in this world we would have the basis to do the grand thing, whatever it is. Could we manifest such a world, this world of 2050? I believe it's more than possible. Picturing the best possible outcome in an exploration explosion may send shock waves out into the universe, which then calls forth the stepping stones by which we can get there. And there are already glimpses through to that ideal world, which flash by in the world of today. The beautiful valley of Ojai in Southern California contains such glimpses of that world here and there. Organic farms stripe the hills amongst orange groves, sharing the valley with some beautiful but contained humanity and leaving plenty of space for the surrounding wilderness. Return for the next edition of this second Ojai Salon for some stories and dialogue from the audience on that beautiful evening in June of 2013. Dulcet tones laid down so artfully by musician Steve Murtaugh. Cover art by Jacob Amon using a photo of Dr. Bruce by Jeffrey Harris. 
Find art, photos, and bare voice versions of this podcast you can use in your projects at www.drbruce.org or through our new easy-to-remember domain www.levityzone.com.